So hello everyone. I'm Dr. Shivika Sethi, the Faculty of Microbiology at Maro. And today we're going to discuss the INI set May 23 microbiology MCQs. So today's discussion is extremely unique. I have never ever discussed so many microbiology questions in my MCQ recall MCQ discussion. So this was a unique one, though it had lots of MCQs which looked like they were medicine MCQs or pediatrics MCQs, but they could be only answered if you had studied microbiology properly. Okay, so we have a huge chunk, at least 90 to 20 questions we're going to discuss today, but not I'm not going to take too much of your time. Secondly, there were so many questions which were clinical vignette based and they had long stems, the questions, as a result of which there was a lot of confusion regarding the actual question. So I might have some made some mistakes in the question itself. I made ha might have made a kidney transplant patient, a heart transplant patient or vice versa. So pardon me for that. That's how the students gave us the recall. And thirdly, this was a unique paper because it had so many mycology questions, as many as six or seven. And all those mycology questions, you won't believe if you look into them deeply, they were all based on your knowledge of the morphology of the fungi. Okay, so it was not very actually tough. But if you knew the morphology of the fungi, you could have answered all of them. Okay, so let's just quickly go through the questions that were asked, just uh, the topics that were asked. So we had few image based questions, about six or seven of them. So we had a question from the cross section of the cell wall of a bacterium, which was image based. Then we had an image based question on of CSF gram stain of a patient of meningitis. Then we had a bacteria whose antibiogram profile was given and we were asked to identify what was that organism. So this was the real bouncer, though it is a repeat. It, I think it was asked about seven years back in AIMS exam. It was a repeat of the same and it was a real tough question. Then we had a question which was image based on the vector. The sugar uh, image was shown. Then we had a question from Nocardia. In fact, actinomycetes family is a very, very commonly asked question. So if you at least know Nocardia and actinomyces are the gram-positive filamentous rods, you're, not, you're sure you're going to get one question definitely right. Then we had a question on syphilis in pregnancy, then bioterrorism agent, then matching of the incubation periods, a parasite which infects the kuffer cells, toxoplasmosis, amoebic liver abscess. So we had three questions from parasitology and we have these so many questions from mycology sorry leaving out this one yeah so septate hyphae then we had a question on candidiasis cutaneous phycomycosis this was a repeat so i have marked out the repeats as you can see there are not many repeat questions though there were yes about 30 to 40 questions uh, were from previous year topics then we had an image-based question on mucormycosis. We have an image-based question on rhinosporidiosis and pheohyphomycosis. Then we had a question from uh, parvoviruses. In fact, we had two questions from parvovirus. One I'm going to discuss and one will be taken up by the pediatrics faculty. And we had four questions from immunology, one of which will be taken up by me and the rest will be taken up by the pathology faculty, right? So with that, we let's move on to doing the questions. A patient presents with pyrexia of unknown origin. He's suspected of suffering from brucellosis. Multiple dilutions of his serum sample are put up for standard agglutination test. The results came as follows. Negative agglutination for the serum dilution 1 is to 20 and 1 is to 40. 1 is to 80 and 160 were positive for agglutination. Which of the following is responsible for the negative test in the first two dilutions? The answer to this question is antibody excess. Okay, I might have got one of these options wrong. Pardon me for that. It's a recall quest, uh, discussion. So we are not sure of the actual options. Right. So how do we answer this question? This is answered by our knowledge on zone phenomenon, also called as the Marex lattice hypothesis. Marex lattice hypothesis. So what it says is that in precipitation and agglutination tests, 
the maximum amount of precipitate or agglutinate is seen only when antigens and antibodies are present in equivalent proportions. If either of them is in excess of the other, there is going to be minimal or no precipitation or agglutination. So as we did in this patient, what are we doing? We're putting up the standard agglutination test for brucellosis. So we have prepared serial dilutions of the patient's serum. One is to 20, one is to 40, one is to 80, one is to 160, one is to 320 and so on. Okay, so we've prepared serial dilutions of the serum. And we are seeing that in these two test tubes, we are seeing positive agglutination, but this agglutination is negative here. I don't know if it was mentioned in the latter two or tubes or not, but it was positive in these two. So basically, this, these are the test tubes in which both antigens and antibodies are present in equivalent proportions. So in standard agglutination tests that we use for diagnosis of brucellosis, we are detecting the presence of antibodies. So obviously, what are we going to add? We're going to add the antigen. So in the earlier two test tubes, what is happening is this patient has such a high titer of antibodies against brucella that when we add the, um, uh, the antigen, the antibody is much more in excess to the antigen. So also in 1 is to 140 dilution. But with further dilution of the patient's serum, what we are seeing is the antibody concentration starts to get reduced and it becomes in equivalent proportion to the antigen. And that's why we are seeing this type of maximum agglutination or it would be precipitation in a precipitation test when both of them are present in equivalent proportions. The reason is that for agglutination or precipitation to be seen, a nice lattice of alternating antigen and antibody must be formed in that tube or on the slide to see it visibly, right? So this is the zone of equivalence. So where the dilution of the serum is less, the antibody is in excess. So what do we call it as? We call it as prozone. This is prozone. And when the further with further dilution, the antigen becomes in excess. This is called as postzone. Okay. So this is antibody excess. This is antigen excess. Next question: cross section of the cell wall of a bacterium is shown. Which is the likely bacterium? Staph aureus, Neisseria meningitidis, E. coli, and Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Now, looking at this figure, what can we see? Most importantly, we are seeing an outer membrane being marked out. Okay, so this is telling us this is a gram negative bacterium. Further confirmed by the presence of the pilus. Okay, then we are seeing a capsular polysaccharide. So, this is a capsulated gram negative bacterium. All gram negatives have the outer membrane and they have pili for adhesion. But what is the biggest hint to us out here is the lipooligosaccharide. So if we go back to the question, this can be easily ruled out because we know it's a gram negative bacterium. But how do we rule out the other two bacteria? This is ruled out by this thing mentioned here, lipooligosaccharide. When I talk about my systemic uh, microbiology lectures, I talk about hemophilus as having lipooligosaccharide, not the LPS in its cell wall. And I talk about both the Neisseria species having the lipooligosaccharide in their cell wall. So either of them have a stunted LPS. They have a stunted endotoxin molecule, which is not called as LPS. It is called as lipooligosaccharide, right? So that's our answer to this question. Neisseria meningitidis. And of course, we know that Neisseria meningitis definitely has a capsule. So moving on to our next question, an elderly male presented with meningitis and the CSF sample was subjected to gram staining and microscopy is as shown in the image given below. Which of the following will be the characteristic of the organism? Now, I had two sets of students telling me that what we saw on gram stain picture was gram positive diplococci, diplococci, which were appearing as lancet shaped or lanceolate shaped. 
Now, this is very, very important for all of you. I have had students telling me that they have made the biggest blunder in the exam, such an easy question, and they have made a mistake in, you know, just in their hurry or, you know, getting the exam surroundings, getting to their uh, senses. Now, I want all of you to keep your senses when you get image-based questions, especially such simple questions. If you have a CSF picture, Okay, you have to look whether it is a gram negative rod of it's a, or it's a gram positive cocus. It's a gram positive rod or gram negative diplococci. Guys, you cannot afford to make a mistake in such questions. So students confusing listeria with streptococcus pneumoniae is a very, very sad story. Please do not do this blunder. So if you saw gram positive diplococci, which were lanceolate shaped, obviously, what are we looking for? We're looking, thinking of streptococcus pneumonia, pneumococcus. Okay. And we know that all pathogenic cocci, it's a blanket rule. All pathogenic cocci are non-motile, are non-motile. So what is the answer to this? So our answer to this question is option D, non-motile at 22 and 37 degrees. Okay. So we move on to if it was listed, if we saw gram positive rods or gram positive bacilli, as you can see in this picture, obviously, what are we going to think of an elderly male, you know, in elderly the topmost causes of meningitis when we think of bacteria are either streptococcus pneumoniae or it is listeria monocytogenes. So here it is specifically mentioned elderly. So the first two organisms that should strike your mind at that time is streptococcus pneumoniae or listeria. So if we saw gram positive rods, that means it is listeria. And we know listeria is a special organism which forms its peritrichus flagellae only at room temperature not at 37 degrees Celsius. So what is our answer? It is motile at room temperature, that is 22 to 25 degrees, and it is non-motile at 37 degrees Celsius. Okay, so what is this called as? This is called as differential motility. So when we think of differential motility, we think of two organisms. One is listeria, and the other is the two species of Yersinia, Yersinia enterocolitica, and Yersinia pseudotuberculosis. Okay. Of course, Yersinia pestis, that's the more important species, but that is a non motile member of Enterobacteriaceae. So, all these organisms show differential motility. So, how we can remember differential motility means at room temperature, that is 25, 22 to 25 degrees Celsius. That is room. The word room is ending with M. Remember, they are motile. And at body temperature of 37 degrees Celsius, they are non-motile. Okay. So their peritrichus flagellae. In all these bacteria, there are peritrichus flagellae. These only form at room temperature. They only form at room temperature, not at 37 degrees Celsius. And of course, a special character of listeria is it's beautiful tumbling motility or end on end motility. So that's a lovely picture that I picked up from the internet. That is what is called as end on end motility or tumbling motility. I hope you all remember Jack and Jill came tumbling down in that rhyme. So they tumbled down the mountain. Okay, we move on to our next question. An isolate from a cancer patient in a critical care unit is found to be resistant to meropenem and aminoglycosides and sensitive to cotrimoxazole and ticarcelin clavulanic acid. What is the likely microorganisms? This I would consider as one of the toughest question of microbiology in this paper. And actually, it is a repeat. As I said earlier, this has been asked about seven years back in the AIMS exam. I distinctly remember looking up the book at that time. Even I was stumped by this question. Okay. So what is the likely organism which is having inherent resistance to meropenem as well as aminoglycosides? This is a unique bacterium. What is the answer? It is tenotrophomonas. Okay. Right. I think the question did also mention that they are it's a gram-negative rod or a gram-negative bacillus. 
unfortunately all these are gram negative rods of course acinetobacter is a gram negative cocobacillus so that could have been ruled out by the morphology mentioned it's a gram negative cocobacillus not a gram negative bacillus right but answer to this is tenotrophomonas multophila now we have a family of gram negative rods that we call as pseudomonadesi so all these are motile gram negative bacilli motile gram negative bacilli which are strict aerobes strict aerobes and we have three genera here one is pseudomonas aeruginosa pseudomonas then we have burkholderia where where we have further three species burkholderia cypatia burkholderia pseudomaly and burkholderia mali now i would like to add here another common point in this family that all of them are environmental saprophytes they are all in moist environment that's where they are normally present but one is an exception burkholderia mali that is an it's a strict horse pathogen horse pathogen okay and it's the only one which is non motile rest all of pseudomonadesi are motile okay so it mainly you get the infection from handling horses so jockeys be, are the people who are more often associated with infection with burkholderia mali okay so of course uh, burkholderia cypatia a very important organism which causes pneumonias in cystic fibrosis and chronic granulomatous disease and this is called as the cypatia syndrome associated with rapid loss of pulmonary function and burkholderia pseudomaly this causes melioidosis melioidosis or the vietnamese time bomb okay now coming to our organisms tenotrophomonas multophila i'm sure many of you might not have even heard of this organism right so even this is a soil saprophyte and mainly is associated with nosocomial infections or infections in cancer patients or cystic fibrosis mainly associated with pneumonias and bacteremias okay now this has lots of efflux pumps you know these are already present in the bacterium and they confer inherent resistance to most beta lactams including meropenem and as well as amino glycosides okay so that was what was mentioned the question meropenem resistance and amino glycoside resistance and it is the drug of choice for it is cotrimoxazole which is given either alone or along with tecarcelin clavulanic acid minocy or terminocycline or ciprofloxacin or moxifloxacin so that was a true bouncer for everyone right we move on to i've already talked about burkholderia i want to just mention that burkholderia cypatia i've already mentioned causes mainly sorry let's not talk about nosocomial infections it in causes pneumonias in chronic granulomatous disease and cystic fibrosis and that's called as the cypatia syndrome okay two more organisms causing infections in cystic fibrosis include staph aureus and pseudomonas aeruginosa but cypatia syndrome is the one where there is rapid loss of pulmonary function in cystic fibrosis here also the drug of choice is cotrimoxazole and other drugs that can be given are carbapenem minocycline as well as ceftazidime okay so it is sensitive generally to carbapenems like meropenem okay next was an image based question which organism is transmitted by the vector shown in the image this is an a repeat question this is the chigger or a chigger of the trombigulid mite chigger of the trombigulid mite and what does it transmit of course the causative agent of scrub typhus that is orientia okay kaisenur forest disease this is transmitted by hard tick chandipura virus is transmitted by sand fly and anaplasma is transmitted again by hard tick okay right now scrub typhus is very very important disease every year at least once in the aims exam or sometimes even twice in the same year aims or ini set will always ask a question on scrub typhus 
I've just put forward these questions in front of, of you right here. So that's the uh, cycle of uh, the life cycle of the trombiculid mite. We have the larva, which needs a blood meal. This generally blood meal is acquired from rodents. So at least once it requires a blood meal during its lifetime. Then it converts into the lymph and the nymph and the adult. They don't require blood meal. They are free living in soil. And then if there is trans ovarial transmission of this uh, organism, Orientia, into the egg. And so it is generations to generation, it is getting transmitted. And it is the larva, larva of the chiggers of the trombiculid mite, which are requiring a blood meal. And sometimes instead of biting a rodent, they are going to bite the human and they are going to transmit the infection to the human. Okay, right. So this is the scrub typhus or it's called the Orientia Triangle. Can you see our country is one of the endemic countries of scrub typhus. So more mainly reported from especially the northeastern areas and especially also from Uttaranchal itself. So hilly areas, that's where it is more common. And a very important cause of meningitis and encephalitis in our country. Okay, So scrub typhus, the causative agent is Orientia, which is further divided into five serotypes. Please remember this. This is sometimes asked. Don't bother to remember the names. At least remember, yes, there are five antigenic types of Orientia transmitted by the sugars of trombiculate mite. Okay, trombiculate mite, the genus is Leptotrombidium. Don't confuse it with the mite of the uh, mite, which is the vector for rickettsia pox. That's caused by rickettsia acari. This is a totally different mite, and that is called as the gamma sid mite. And it's not transmitted by the larval stage there. Here, larva is the uh, transmission agent out here. Reservoir is rodents, and there is something called a zoonotic tetrad, where this gets completed, transmission is successful. So what is the zoonotic tetrad? One is the organism, other is the chiggers, third is the rodent, and a special scrub vegetation. At the site of the bite of the chiggers, there is a typical lesion that is formed that is called as Eshkar. Patients generally, generally presents with fever, mild jazz rash, and some people develop the complications of encephalitis and meningitis. I hope you all remember that in the wheel Felix reaction, the patient develops OXK antibodies. OXK antibodies. Okay. Right. Treatment. Yes, even this has been asked. Drug of choice is doxycycline. Now, this was a question that was asked as an image based question at least three years back. Exactly. I'm not able to find out where in which exam it was asked, but it was shown what is this life cycle or transmission cycle of. So whenever if you see the six legged larva, six legged larva is what is transmitting the infection to humans. We are going to think of scrub typhus. Right. So larval forms, they are the only, I mean, the vectors in case of Orientia. Right. This was a question that was asked regarding the Eshkar. Eshkar is found in all of the following except or Eshkar is seen in which of the following? Cutaneous anthrax, scrub typhus, spotted fevers, except Rocky Mountain spotted fever and brown recluse spider bite. Next question, match the disease with a maximum incubation period. So syphilis, SARS, chickenpox, hepatitis A. Generally, we know the incubation period of most of these diseases. They are so important for us. Syphilis, the, max, the incubation period ranges from 9 to 90 days. So obviously, the maximum incubation period becomes 90 days. SARS, it's a variable incubation period. We'll come to it at the end by elimination. Chickenpox, the incubation period is about seven days or seven to 21 days or 10 to 21 days. So what is the answer here? 21 days. Hepatitis A, 15 to 50 days. So our answer is this one. So obviously, what are we getting for SARS? It is 10 days. What's the answer? It is option A, right? CDC has classified 30 organisms into various categories of bioterrorism agent. Which of the following is the false statement? Category A, easily spread in high mortality and morbidity, right? Category B, slow spread, low mortality, right? 
category C easily spread high mortality and their emerging diseases. Absolutely right. What is incorrect is option D. There is no category D bioterrorism agent. So pretty simple. So the center of disease control, whatever organisms can be used as bioterrorism agent, have been classified into three groups, A, B, and C. So category A contains those agents which are easily disseminated or transmitted from person to person. They are associated with high mortality and morbidity rates. They can cause public panic and social disruption, and they require special action for public health preparedness. So government authorities need to get into action. In category B, we have agents which are moderately easy to disseminate. They are associated with moderate morbidity and low mortality rates, and they require specific enhancements of the CDC's diagnostic capacity and enhanced disease surveillance. Category C are the are easily disseminated agents which are associated with high mortality and morbidity. And these are emerging pathogens, right? So if you remember category A and category C, you can come on to the category B. Category B contains the highest number. So category A contains Bacillus anthracis, Yersinia pestis, Francisella tularensis. These are the three bacteria. Then we have a toxin, the botulinum toxin. Then we have two viruses, the smallpox virus and viral hemorrhagic fevers, which are associated with high mortality rates. Not any. There are so many like dengue, yellow fever would not be included under the category A because they don't have such high mortality rates as are seen with filoviruses like Ebola and Marburg, arena viruses like Lassa fever and Machupo virus. Then coming to category B, this contains Brucella, Burkholderia, Mali, and Pseudomali, Chlamydia, Cytacea, Coxella, Burnetii, Rickettsia, Provazaki. Then we have toxins, the ricin toxin, Staphylococcal enterotoxin B, Epsilon toxin of Clostridium perfringens. And then we have viral encephalitis like Eastern equine, Western equine, and Venezuelan equine encephalitis food safety threats like Salmonella, E. coli, O157, H7, Shigella, and water safety threats like Vibrio cholerae and Cryptosporidium. In category C, we have the Nipah virus and the Hendra virus, right? So we don't have any category D bioterrorism agent. A pregnant female came, came for her antenatal checkup she gives a history of stillbirth at 28 weeks of gestation a year back. She also gives a history of having multiple sexual partners and vaguely remembers having painless ulcer or ulcers. I'm not sure on that. Sometime before her last pregnancy. What would be your first step of investigation in this lady? So we have a pregnant female who has given a history of having a stillbirth at 28 weeks of gestation and some painless ulcers on the genital and multiple sexual partners. So what will you do first for first investigation? What are we suspecting? We are suspecting syphilis in this female because there is a history of stillbirth because syphilis, you know, it can lead to syphilis in pregnancy can lead to stillbirths. Okay. So that is why we are going to think of Treponema pallidum as the causative agent. So what is the step we are going to use in diagnosis? Venereal disease research laboratory test. Of course, our first option is going to be this one because we're going to think of she's pregnant. She's going to be having further uh, uh, some effect on the fetus. So we should immediately carry out the VDRL test to arrive at that diagnosis of syphilis and treat her accordingly rapidly with benzathine penicillin okay right so microscopy of the ulcer scrape would not be possible because those would have already been healed culture is also not possible because we don't have specimen from where we can get the uh i mean uh, scraping or anything like that and even culture is not a routine method for diagnosis of syphilis because it's a difficult to culture it's an obligate intracellular non-cultivable on cell free media and culture is only possible on rabbit Testes. So our answer here is VDRL test. For diagnosis of syphilis, we all know that we have two-step approach. One is the screening test, 
done by a non-triponemal test like VDRL or an RPR test. When this comes reactive, then we are going to confirm with a triponemal test commonly used are the TPHA or the TPPA. Okay. Now, I just want to give you a small reminder uh, regarding the Kasowitz law that a pregnant female if she has, I mean, rather a female who has untreated syphilis, there is gradual diminution of the degree of congenital transmission of the syphilis from the mother to the fetus. So more further away, the pregnancy is from the infection, meaning the duration between the infection and the pregnancy, the lesser the severity of the disease in the child. So it's a pattern which begins with miscarriage followed by stillbirth, neonatal bed, living but diseased children, and finally she gives birth to healthy children. Okay, that's the Cassowitz law. A patient presented with a lesion on the left buttock, he has a history of heart transplant 15 years back. Aspirate from the lesion shows gram-positive branching filamentous bacteria identify the organism. Whenever we read gram-positive branching filamentous bacteria, which family are we going to think of? Straight away think of the family Actinomycetes. And what is the member which is here, written here? Nocardia, right? So that is the causative agent of this lesion on his left buttock. Okay, right. So gram-positive branching filamentous bacteria, think of the family actinomycetes, which contains nocardia and actinomyces. So very important differences between the two. How do we differentiate? Their morphology is absolutely the same on gram stain. Nocardia is a soil saprophyte. So you always get the infection from the environment. It is a strict aerobe and it is partially acid fast, meaning acid fast with 1.5 to 1% of sulfuric acid. In contrast, actinomyces has the same morphology on gram stain, but there is no environmental source for, source for actinomyces. It's a strict human commensal, maybe in the mouth, in the GI tract, or in the vagina. It's a strict anaerobe and it is non-acid fast. Okay, so that's our gram stain picture, gram positive filamentous rods showing branching. It could be either nocardia, it could be either or actinomyces. But when we do the modified acid, acid fast stain, uh, on, on the acid fast rod would be seen only uh, with nocardia, whereas actinomyces will get decolorized. Okay, a pregnant lady very carefully disposes the litter of her house cat regularly to avoid infection by toxoplasma. Which of the following is the infective stage of toxoplasma that can be acquired via cat feces? Bradyzoids, tissue cysts, oocysts, and tachyzoids. What is the answer? Oocyst. Oocyst is that infective form which can be acquired by handling cats. Okay. So here is the life cycle of toxoplasma. That's the mode of transmission. So we know that in toxoplasma, the definitive host is the cat. And in cat feces, what is the form that is found? It is unsporulated oocyst. Okay, this in a, the next three to four days becomes sporulated to become the infective form for man. So directly from cat feces, we cannot get infection. Only when the egg, the oocyst remains in the environment, it becomes, it develops sporozoids in it and becomes infective to man. That's the usual cycle of transmission between rodents and birds and cats. Sometimes ingestion of these sporo related oocysts in the environment can be acquired by animals like pigs and cows and sheep, etc. So let's see what are the infective form in each of them, right? So in case we are ingesting poorly cooked meat, what is this containing? This is containing tissue cysts. And these tissue cysts have bradyzoids in them. So please note in toxoplasma, whatever mode of infection we are getting the getting it, there are different modes, uh, there are different infective forms. So here the infective form is tissue cysts. Then these sporulated oocysts can be ingested by humans by ingesting contaminated water or unwashed plants. So what would be the form here? Then it would be oocyst, the sporulated oocyst. And so also while cleaning cat litter walks, we can get the infection via contaminated hands. That would be again the sporulated oocyst. 
what about blood transfusion what about vertical transmission what is the infective form here here the infective form are the tachyzoids so such an interesting life cycle there is out here so many infective stages in the toxoplasma life cycle for humans okay so that was our answer sporulated oocyst next question protozoan parasites seen in kaffir cells what are kaffir cells these are the macrophages liver macrophages okay so when we think of a parasite which parasitizes the macrophages that is part of the reticuloendothelial system what is it what is it immediately going to strike our mind it is definitely leishmania if you go back to my videos on marrow i always say that's the first line that i talk about leishmania it is a reticuloendothelial cell parasite and the second special point about it that i talk about is again very commonly asked it contains the kinetoplast which is a special type of mitochondrial dna okay babesia and plasmodium where do they localize they localize in the rbcs okay yes we can eliminate toxoplasma because generally it can yes it can infect mainly it infects the muscle cells not kaffir cells okay right so those are the uh, ld bodies in case of leishmania inside the macrophages what is this stage there are just two stages in the life cycle of leishmania the infective form is the promastigote what is this out here the ld body it is the a mastigote stage a mastigote stage the a mastigote has that special uh, of course even the pro mastigote and a mastigote both of them have the single nucleus and that kinetoplast so you can see these double dot sign somewhere in some of them yeah there yeah. so that's the a mastigote stage okay so typical example of a reticuloendothelial cell parasite now please remember kinetoplast this is very very often kinetoplast is present in which of the following organisms just think of either trypanosomes or think of leishmania these are the only two protozoa which are meaning clinically relevant for us trypanosoma and leishmania it's a special type of mitochondrial dna a 25 year old male presents with fever severe pain in the upper right abdominal quadrant he gives a history of bloody diarrhea 3 weeks back abdominal ct shows a lesion in the right lobe of the liver which has ragged edges multiple septations and heterogeneous densities i'm not sure this was written or it was something like loculations are seen loculations mainly is telling us there are multiple septations present in it what is the most likely diagnosis now what is this the patient has presented with something in the liver and which is seen also on abdominal ct and the patient has a history of bloody diarrhea just 3 weeks back immediately what are we going to think of we are thinking of amoebic liver abscess following that episode of amoebic dysentery some students in their hurry have made the mistake of marking hydrated cyst when does hydrated cyst cause diarrhea in humans guys no it is just acquired by handling dog feces and straight away you're going to land up with the hydrated cyst with no episode of diarrhea okay right so entamoeba histolytica the causative agent of amoebic dysentery as well as amoebic liver abscess the infection is very very common in our country especially developing countries fecal oral transmission most of the infections remain asymptomatic and 10 to 20% of symptomatic develop amoebic dysentery and invasive diarrhea where the trophozoites invade the colonic mucosa leading to the flask shaped or water bottle ulcers patient presents with fever diarrhea and dysentery and diagnosis can be done by stool pcr or antigen detection or stool microscopy or by stool culture okay but a small percentage especially in males in comparison to female look at the ratio 10 to 1 this in these males what happens is the trophozoites enter the portal circulation and produce those proteolytic enzymes in the liver leading to amoebic liver abscess most commonly seen in the right lobe of the 
liver and whereby the patient presents with so after an episode two to three weeks after that episode of dysentery patient presents with fever or a pain or heaviness or lump in the hypochondrium or tender hepatomegaly and these the diagnosis here is primarily carried out by demonstrating leukocytosis along with elevated liver enzymes and serology along with imaging like ultrasound and CT scan. Okay, By serology, we are detecting the antibodies. And by imaging, of course, we are detecting the abscess. Right. So our answer to this was amoebic liver abscess. A 60-year-old female from South India came with complaints of blood tinged nasal discharge and sometimes epistaxis. The examination revealed pink colored exophytic mass on the right nostril. Sorry, it should be the left nostril according to the picture. The patient's image and histopathology are given. What is your diagnosis? Okay, so South India is endemic for rhinosporidiosis. This is that exophytic mass, the nasal polyp. And on microscopy, what are we seeing? We are seeing the sporangia, which are filled with endospores. Sporangia filled with endospores. It looks quite similar to what we see in coccidioides also. But in coccidioides, generally, coccidioides anyway is not reported from our country. So this is our country. Our diagnosis is rhinosporidiosis. Okay, in mucormycosis, we would not see these endosporangia. Uh, we would see aseptate ribbon like hyphae. And in rhinoscleroma, we would not see these structures. Okay, what would we see? We would see miculic cells. Okay, so I'll just, I'll just come to rhinoscleroma. Okay, so those are some pictures of rhinosporidiosis, not just in the nose, but these similar polyps can arise in the mucosa of the oral cavity, the respiratory tract, or even in the conjunctiva, and even rarely in the vaginal mucosa, um, mucosa of the genital tract. Okay, so those are the sporangia filled with endospores. Then coming to rhinoscleroma, this is caused by a bacterium, right? Before that, let me just go back. I just wanted to tell you that rhinosporidium seaberry, rhinosporidium seaberry, was earlier classified as a fungus. It is no longer a fungus, but it is now classified as an aquatic protistan parasite. Aquatic protistan parasite. All the others, you know, the protozoa, they belong to the phylum protista. So rhinosporidium is now a protistan parasite. It is mainly, you know, people who are in contact with water, especially stagnant water of ponds, etc. That's where it is commonly found. Okay, I think the even the occupation in this was mentioned that she was a cattle breeder or she had a cattle farm or something like that was mentioned. So cattles are often left in ponds, right? So that's where rhinosporidium is often present. So coming to rhinoscleroma, this is caused by a Klebsiella, the gram-negative bacterium Klebsiella, rhinoscleromatis, a chronic granulomatous disease of the upper respiratory tract mostly. And we get this kind of granulomatous diseases. Huge uh, granulomas are formed in the tissues. Okay, And uh, one of uh, these uh, disappearance of the nose is also called as the Hebra nose. And on doing a biopsy, what we see is a mixed inflammatory cell inflate, filtrate containing neutrophils, plasma cells, as well as lymphocytes. And there are macrophages foamy macrophages which are containing those gram negative rods so these are the miculix cells a 60 year old male had an injury on the left hand following which his left limb turned erythematous and swollen he has a history of renal transplant 10 years back mason fontana stain was positive on the biopsy taken from his left link limb what is the most likely causative agent? Okay, now Aspergillus fumigator, Stelromyces marnifi, Blastomyces dermatitis. I am not sure whether this was written or the answer or not, but I have just added it because that is the answer. Now, this is a pretty confusing question. 
patient has some injury on the left hand, it turned swollen, it became erythematous. But what is the biggest hint to us? What is the agent that is the causative agent is? Mason Fontana stain. Mason Fontana, I talk about it in my regular classes as well as revision classes. I always show you a picture that this is a stain which demonstrate or it stains only pigmented fungi. That is the melanin containing fungi. So obviously in the question, if you are in your senses, you have kept your composure in your exam, you will easily arrive at this answer. If the others will not know if you've taken my classes, you've understood the importance of whatever I say in the class, that means you're going to answer this. Amongst the option, the only pigmented mold or the fungus out here is bipolaris. We all know aspergillus is a high line septate mold. Teleromyces marnify, as well as Blastomyces dermatitidis, both of them are dimorphic fungi, but when they exist as mold, what do we study them as? Highline septate molds. So if you know the morphology of these three, obviously by elimination, you can ans answer this question. It is Mason Fontana stain, which is staining a pigmented mold or a pigmented fungus out of this option is bipolaris. I don't know if that, it could be alternaria, curvularia, phylophora or whatever is mentioned, okay? And this is uh, evidence to show you that this is what I've mentioned, Mason Fontana silver stain stains only the pigment. So the answer you needed to look for here was the pigmented mold, okay? So let's talk about, we know of many pigmented molds causing infections. The cutaneous and subcutaneous infections caused by the pigmented, pheoid, dematiaceous, or the dark walled fungi include mycetoma. You know, mycetoma can be caused when we see black or brown colored granules. We know it is, could be madurella, it could be exophiella. Then we have chromoblastomycosis. Okay, you all have studied about it. So are uh, commonly asked in our exams, the medlar, the muriform, the sclerotic or the copper penny bodies. So even this is caused by a pigmented mold. But here what we are seeing is, if we are not, we are seeing a, not as a mold, we are seeing it as rounded structures showing septations, which are called as muriform bodies. We, these are the causative agents, foncitiae, cladophyllophora, phyllophora, and rhinocladiella. Uh, right, and we have the third infection that is pheohyphomycosis, which is again caused by pink. This was the diagnosis out here. Pheohyphomycosis is when it is not seen as a rounded structure. These pigmented molds are seen as septate molds, which are brown colored. Okay, so these include alternaria, bipolaris, curvularia, cladophyllophora, exophiella, and so on. There's a huge list of pigmented molds. I've just told you the important ones. So please remember this table. It's very, very important. Pigmented molds, what all diseases do they cause? Here they are appearing as molds. Here they are appearing as rounded structures. And mycetoma has a totally different macroscopic appearance that swellings with sinus, the sinuses and the granules are seen. Okay. So this is a picture of cutaneous hypho, pheohyphomycosis. Okay, please remember the difference between chromoblasto and pheohyphomycosis. Both of them may look the same, but in chromoblasto, we are seeing them as rounded structures. In pheohyphomycosis, we are seeing them as mold forms. Okay, so in this question, let's go back to the question out here. Yeah, so our, the biggest hint was the Mason Fontana's stain. Okay, those are some pictures. So these are the brown colored pigmented hyphae which are seen on hematoxyl and eosine stain and that is our mason fontana's stain any silver stain always stains the organism black a patient with a history of bone marrow transplant presented with cuff chest heaviness for the last two weeks so this is an immunocompromised patient with cuff and chest heaviness x-ray chest shows consolidation in the lung a lung biopsy was obtained. On microscopic examination of the biopsy, the organism appeared as is shown in the figure. Now, this I'm sure everyone has got it correct. What are we seeing? We are seeing septate hyphae, which are typically showing dichotomous branching or acute angle or 45 degree angle branching. What is our answer? Aspergillosis. 
Yes, it is easily detectable, diagnosable. What is our answer? But let's just discuss the other options. What would we see on mucormycosis? We would see high, or rather ribbon-like hyphae, which are showing no septations. In cryptococcosis, that's a true yeast. You would see yeast forms. Budding yeast, that's what you would see. What about histoplasmosis? In, at 37 degrees Celsius, it always exists as the yeast form. So that would also be seen as a budding yeast. Right. So that's the typical dichotomous branching, dichotomous or acute angled or 45 degree angled branching of aspergillus. Right. Okay. So these are further few pictures of uh, the beautiful 45 degree angle branching. You can see it here also. You can see it here also. And what is special about aspergillus? Why is any kind of invasive aspergillus is a very, very dangerous disease? It's an emergency because it is angio invasive. So you can see here angio invasiveness. So you can see those hyphal forms even in the blood vessels. So remember, there are two angio-invasive fungi. One is aspergillus. The other one are the mucorails, which cause mucormycosis, mucorails. A 22-year-old female came to the OPD with progressive swelling on her left side of the face. She has a history of traumatic injury with a wooden stick two months back. CECT nose and the paranasal sinuses show mass in the subcutaneous tissues with normal sinuses. Biopsy shows foreign body granuloma with positive pass and Grocott's methanamine silver stain. Sorry, silver is not mentioned. Likely diagnosis is. So we have this kind of an appearance. I think in the question it was a male, put a female, because that's the picture I got. Okay. So the hint to the answer is the positive pass and the positive Grocott's methanamine. Grocott's methanamine silver is a typical stain which stains the fungi. It stains the fungi and which is the fungal disease out here? None except phycomycosis. Phycomycosis is the other name for mucormycosis or zygomycosis. Okay, latest name is mucormycosis, older names were zygomycosis or phycomycosis. Okay, so this is not the usual uh, mucormycosis, which is rhino oculocerebral mucormycosis. It's a very rare illness. This patient must have been a diabetic or maybe on high dose steroids. That's why she's developed after that wooden stick injury, this cutaneous mucormycosis. Okay, so our answer here is option B. Why do we say it is not a rhinocerebral disease? Because it is mentioning that it is the sinuses are normal. All the mass that is seen is in the subcutaneous tissues. Okay. So those are the, that's the Grocots or the Gomery's methanamine silver stain. You can see the green background and you can see the broad ribbon-like aseptate hyphae. Aseptate hyphae. What are aseptate hyphae also called as? Cenocytic hyphae. And what kind of branching do they show with obtuse angled or 90 degree angled branching? So unlike the 45 degree angle branching, this is much more when they branch out. Okay, let's move on to our next question. Identify the fungus which is seen on histology. I am not sure whether there was some clinical vignette or history associated with this. I know it was an image-based question. And here what we are seeing are these broad ribbon-like hyphae. Okay. And no with no septations. Because what are options that I've got are all these are the options which are the answer. So most likely this was, this was a multiple correct question. Aspergillus is the only one which is a septate hy has septate hyphae. All the others, mucor, conidiobolus, as well as basidiobolus, have broad ribbon-like hyphae, which have no septations. Right? You might not have heard of conidiobolus and basidiobolus, but people who have taken my lectures in, on marrow would have been aware that right at the end of subcutaneous 
fungal infections. I've discussed about these two organisms, right? I'll show you the evidence of the same. So the phylum glomerulomycetes, this contains all the aseptate molds, which reproduce asexually by the formation of sporangiospores and sexual spores are the zygospores. Okay, this phylum is further having two members, mucorails and entomophthorails. So mucorails are causing mucormycosis, zygomycosis or phycomycosis. And those are the examples, rhizopus mucor, rhizomucor, saxenia, lichthemia, epophysomyces, etc. And entomophthorails cause entomophthoromycosis which is conidiobolomycosis and basidiobolomycosis, okay? These are very rare conditions and they are very, very sad conditions. If you Google search a couple of pictures of these bolo, uh, conidiobolo or basidiobolomycosis, you're going to be shocked seeing those pictures. I'm not sure if this picture actually was shown in the exam or not. Okay, right. So this is evidence as to my talking about entomophthoromycosis. So we've talked about uh, order entomophthorales. I've talked about basidiobolus and conidiobolus. And I've talked about phylum glomerulomycetes, which are aseptate hyphae, talking about these entomophthorales and mucorils. So our answer to this was multiple correct, mucor, conidiobolus, and basidiobolus. An elderly diabetic male on immunosuppressive therapy for kidney transplant 10 years ago presents with cough and dyspnea for the last one week. Sputum microscopy grows gram-positive budding yeast and pseudo hyphae. What is the likely diagnosis? Of course, amongst the options, candidiasis, aspergillosis, mucormycosis, mu information not enough to make a diagnosis, my answer would be invasive candidiasis because I know aspergillus does not exist as yeast, mucormycosis does not ex if show yeast form, they show molds, they are all mold forms, whereas candida can ex generally exist as it's a yeast-like fungus, which forms yeasts and pseudohyphae, which are a series of buds which have failed to separate from the parent cell, okay? And rarely, a few of them may also form the true hyphae, which are called as germ tubes, okay? So our answer here is option A. Information is not enough to make a diagnosis, even that's a tempting question, uh, option, but here what rules that out is the presence of pseudo hyphae in the sputum specimen. Had it just been a commensal, had Canada being just present as a commensal, we would have just seen the yeast form. If we are seeing pseudo hyphae, it is showing that there is invasion occurring. And hence our answer is invasive candidiasis, right? So these are the yeasts along with pseudo hyphae. Pseudo hyphae are a series of buds which have failed to separate from the parent cell, given off another bud, given off another bud and so on. That's pseudo hyphae. Okay, so that does with our questions on mycology. If you go back to them, rewind, you will notice all of them were based on knowing the morphology of the fungi, nothing beyond that. The causative agent of the condition shown also causes which of the following? Kaposi sarcoma, gingivostomatitis, molluscum contagiosum, and pure red cell aplasia. What are we seeing out here? We are seeing this typical slap cheek rash. Slap cheek rash, that means this is a parvovirus infection. And what does parvovirus also called cause amongst the options? It causes pure red cell aplasia in immunodeficient individuals. Okay, so our answer here is option D. Parvovirus B19 causes slap cheek rash. Okay, let's, it's parvovirus, I have noticed, has been asked continuously in all INI set. If you go back at least, you know, four to five INI set exams, repeatedly being asked, but in different forms. So it's a PYT. It's a previous year topic, really uh, one of the very commonly asked ones. So a primary infection with parvovirus is very, very common. We all have been infected with parvovirus during our childhood. Usually it's an asymptomatic infection, but when symptomatic, it can cause in different age groups, 
so many manifestations. So in healthy children, it causes fifth disease or erythema infectiosum, which is characteristically associated with a slap cheek rash on the face and a lacy rash on the extremities along with fever and joint pains. Older children, when they have a primary infection, they get a disease called as papillopurpuric gloves and socks syndrome. This was a question in last time, November AIMS. In adults, a primary infection can, can present as acute symmetric sore, small joint arthropathies, which is generally self-limited. In patients suffering with hemolytic anemia, like hereditary spherocytosis, thalassemias, or sickle cell anemia, it causes aplastic crisis. In immunodeficient indiv individual, the infection of RBCs is uncontrolled because there is its immunodeficiency. Hence, the patient develops pure red cell aplasia. And finally, a primary infection in pregnancy, especially in the first half of pregnancy, unfortunate transmission in 30 to 33 percent of cases to the fetus leading to non-immune fetal hydrops okay so remember it is always a primary infection with parvovirus not otherwise okay right so that brings us to the end of our discussion of the INI set may 23 exams bye bye